the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, 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 we confess that we are our nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may be life in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his infinite love, has had mercy on us and sent his only begotten Son into the flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. Therefore, in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and pray, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
and with your spirit. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest, cleanse us by the power of your redeeming blood that in purity and peace we may worship and adore your holy name. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading comes from the book of Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter. Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the just decrees that the Lord your God commanded you to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord your God, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house, and on your gates. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from the epistle to the Hebrews of the ninth chapter. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things, then to the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the sprinkling of defiled persons with the blood of goats and bulls and with the ashes of a heifer sanctifies for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without punish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise as they In the name of our God, the Holy Trinity, we confess our faith. 
I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made. Who for us men and for our salvation came down to them and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us and our sons. He suffered and buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again. If you're like me and you're hopelessly addicted to Facebook, you've probably seen this cartoon that's always circulating from The Wizard of Oz when Dorothy is speaking with a scarecrow. She asks him this question, how can you do so much talking without a brain? To which the scarecrow says, oh, there's a lot of people without a brain who do a great deal of talking. This is most certainly true. I was thinking of that reading our gospel text Jesus has high praise for the scribe in the text. Most importantly, higher praise than he's given to any of his 12 apostles regarding their understanding of Scripture. The guy, you expect him to come up and challenge Jesus the way the adversaries have been doing. And maybe that is what he had in mind, but he's smarter than all of the people that are opposed to Jesus, and Jesus recognizes that the guy is a great deal smarter. He asks him, what is the greatest commandment? It sort of is a trick question, isn't it? If you remember your catechesis in Dr. Martin Luther's catechism, all the commandments are pretty much the same. To fear and love God that we do not kill or harm. To fear and love God that we do not steal. To fear and love God that we do not lie. Always to fear and love God. Because ultimately there's one commandment. Violation of any of the commandments demonstrate that we do not fear and love God and we do not love our neighbor as ourselves. Jesus gives the right answer, of course. The greatest commandment is the one we had read earlier in Deuteronomy. Moses repeats it. Before he gives the list of commandments, and after those ten, 
thousands of other rules and regulations from God Almighty, first Moses sums them up, saying to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus cites it, and the scribe in the text is actually excited. He says, you've spoken rightly. He's excited about it because the Spirit has been working on him through the Word. He's no doubt heard from plenty of rabbis and plenty of Pharisees and Sadducees and Zealots, all sorts of bad interpretations of the Scripture. And the guy is ready to get on board with a decent one. Yes, all of those commandments and regulations over which the Pharisees obsess with the washing of hands and of pots and of kettles and separating your dishes and all of this other nonsense of which they think your salvation is dependent upon can all be actually summed up as simply as love. Love. Not love as the world defines it. Love as God defines it. To love the Lord your God with everything that you have and everything that you are and to love your neighbor, at least in theory, as much as you love yourself. That's the aim of the law. It's the goal of the law. It's the positive aspect of God's law, that beautiful thing which we are given to aspire to, that the Spirit works through, to that word of the Lord that says, this is the truth. But this poor man has this other problem, and maybe that doesn't stand out as strongly in our text. Jesus, of course, knows what it is, Jesus tells him, you are not far from the kingdom. Let's think about that. You're not far from damnation. You are almost not going to hell. That's sort of like being a little bit pregnant. Jesus gives him the high praise, but says, you're so close to the kingdom, but he doesn't put him in it. And why not? Why can't he be there? Why? The guy knows the law. He's got the summary. He understands it right. He should love. And he's filled with love and that love of God. But he reiterates something that Jesus knows immediately by knowing what he's thinking. That he's got horribly wrong. He says, you have spoken rightly, Rabbi. The Lord our God is one. Yes, that is is what the text says. But the man does not have even remotely an inkling or beginning of understanding the Holy Trinity, of understanding who the Holy Spirit is, of accepting the fact that when the Christ comes, even by prophecy in the Old Testament, he will be God in the flesh. He rejects that. We know that Jesus knows that because of what Jesus does next. He says the young man is not far from the kingdom. And then almost with a heartbroken sadness that this young man is still outside the kingdom, he says to his disciples, how can David call the Christ, refer to the Christ as Lord if he's his descendant. If he's descendant of David and is only a human, why is it that David says in the prophecy, my Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David knew by the power of the Holy Spirit that one of his descendants would be the Christ. But more than that, he understood what that meant. That the Christ would be God and man fused. David believed in the Holy Trinity. He knew about the Trinity yet to be manifest, manifest in its own way, in his own time. He didn't use the word, but he knew what it was. As surely as Abraham called the three visitors to him all Lord, because he understood at some level the Trinity, David knew. Jesus goes into this in our text not in the the sort of fumbling way it first appears, but it's because he's just met this young man who knows the word of the Lord forwards and backwards, who has a better understanding of it than the Pharisees and the other scribes around him, but he does not get the Trinity. And it puts him, however close we describe it, outside the kingdom. I want to emphasize this because this is the essence of both law and gospel. This is one of those things that it's really hard for us to accept. Oh, we don't know the guy in the text. We might know objectively and say, well, if he's that close to the kingdom, why does he have to be outside it? But when it comes to people we care about, people living now, people that are friends, loved ones, family members, people who maybe pass away outside the church, 
faithless by every description. And we go to their funerals and we always say the same thing. They were such great people. He was such a nice guy. And we want so much to believe that we're going to see him in heaven because he was just such a nice guy. Wonderful people die and are damned every single instant because we measure them as wonderful based on what? Our limited exposure to them in this world. Because maybe they were generous. Maybe they were kind. But in their rebellion against God, which is inherent to all of us, in their faithlessness, they hated Jesus. They denied Jesus. They rejected Jesus. This is the law of God, the heartbreaking, heart-rending law that says the nicest people we've ever met, I don't know where his faith was, but picture Mr. Rogers going to hell. Picture anybody that we think of as a great human being ending up in hell. Think of Gandhi, the great peacemaker Gandhi, who was a Hindu and an idolater and had over a million gods. Great, wonderful people in a human sense, in a secular sense. And the harsh law of God is you are not far from the kingdom, but you're outside of it. And being outside of the kingdom means eternal death and damnation. This is the harsh truth. Jesus even feels it. Christ, God without sin, human without sin, God in the flesh, he feels it because he has anguish enough to go into it further as soon as the scribe leaves. How? How can they say that he's only going to be human, this Christ? David calls me Lord in the prophecy. Why don't they know it? Jesus and his human nature is filled with angst over the fact that this scribe who's so close doesn't get it. And he's banging his head against the table is against his pastoral desk saying, how do they not get that the text says? If Jesus can feel that angst, then we should feel no self-doubt or self-emoliation for us also feeling that angst. Good people in a worldly sense, people that we love, people that we admire, can be outside the kingdom. But the thing that's really angsty about that, the thing that should really cause us pain, is not that God is somehow unjust. Not that, boy, if only God would loosen up. If only the Almighty God would just make it a little bit easier. What about those people that are so close and yet so far away? But the bottom line is that God couldn't possibly make it any easier on us mortals. He gives the law at Mount Sinai, but even then, with all of those rules and regulations to teach us the difference between good and evil, he still makes sure he gives us the summary, love one another, just do it. Love God with your whole heart and love one another. That's all there is to it. Love doesn't steal. Love doesn't murder. Love doesn't lie. Love doesn't abuse. Just love one another for gosh darn it's sake. And much more than that, infinitely more, he becomes flesh and dies for the sins of the world. Jesus opens the gates to eternal life for free, for nothing. There's absolutely nothing required of us to earn our salvation, to deserve it. In fact, everything about us, everything that's uniquely you and me, is in rebellion against God, hates Jesus, and rejects the cross. Jesus puts the Holy Spirit in us to fill us with things like faith and new life and passion and a desire to do good, things which are completely alien righteousness from outside of ourselves. He does it all. He does all the work entirely, all the time, and all we have to do is believe it doesn't get any easier than the way that God made it. We look at it wrong when we look at the people we count as wonderful humans and wonder why God didn't just let them into heaven. We're putting the judgment backwards. The key is, is that they're guilty. All human beings are guilty. And the unbeliever is guilty of being an unbeliever. And the sinner is guilty of being a sinner. Jesus Christ could literally not have made life and salvation and eternal life and the new creation any easier than he already has. It's as simple as here I'm giving it out 
here, take it, take it, take it. He follows us around trying to give us the gift. He sends his word and his angels and his Holy Spirit into the world and to preach, to share, to love, to reinforce, to deliver this gift of faith that pursues those people. However wonderful we count them, the unbeliever was chased their whole life by Jesus who tried to give them gifts and they just didn't take them. Nothing is contingent, therefore, on him. Nothing about this is harsh judgment or condemnation. It's all contingent on us. Salvation is a free gift. Damnation is entirely our fault. That is the paradox of faith. But Christ lives only to give good gifts. And this beautiful moment of this gospel text that he is filled with angst himself because he wants the scribe to get it. Because he's pouring his Holy Spirit on this scribe and by whatever mysterious force It's not getting through his thick, walled head and heart. Even Jesus feels the angst because it's so simple. Thank God it's so simple because were it not by the power of Christ chasing us and giving it to us, none of us would have this gift to be here, to be in his house, to receive his washing, his absolution, and his body and blood, all of the gifts of eternal life, would be beyond us forever, except he keeps chasing us and heaping them on us, however hard we try to run away. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
For Louise Richardson's family and loved ones, for the sweet repose of her soul in heaven, for the Holy Spirit and holy angels to surround, fill, and be with all who mourn and bereave. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. For all those in need or distress throughout the world, for all those to whom death is drawing near, and for us all, that when our last hour may come, we may depart this life with the confidence of a true faith, a right, devout, and holy hope, and be seated at the wedding feast of the Lamb in his kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear our prayer, O Lord, strengthen, deliver, and preserve us. For to you alone we ascribe all glory, honor, and power, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, with angels, archangels, all saints, and the whole company of heaven, we laud and magnify your <coughs> glorious name, evermore praising you and the same. <laughs>
true body and true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Strengthen and preserve you and keep you steadfast in the true faith, even until life everlasting. Go in his peace. Amen. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.